regard the diversity of the school and the student body, not only in terms of national and cultural barriers, but also economic and financial barriers. The AA needs the support of individuals and organizations prepared to invest in its future. All our work as architects, educators, administrators, council members, is really to enable our students to develop the kind of architecture that will make a difference. But the school, in a sense, is nothing without its students, without their work. With the onset of fees for higher education across the board, obtaining outside support for scholarship has become one of the main fundraising priorities for us at the AA. In the past 10 years, appeals and campaigns have played a very important role for the AA. This, all these efforts have been supported by the AA Council, by the Foundation Trustees, and the Campaign Board. This is the work that really must continue. Currently, the students at the AA receive bursaries and scholarships. Students who are at the AA receive bursaries, and new students uh, receive scholarships. And it is the immediate aim, our immediate aim, is really to increase this number of bursaries and scholarships. And of course, our ultimate aim is to have a school that is fully endowed so that anyone who uh, uh, qualifies to enter the school uh, would be able to enter the school. But right now, we also have a more immediate task, and that immediate task is for us to open the school to those students of merit who, because of their financial status, cannot afford to attend the school. Recently, we have initiated a number of named bursaries. The first of these has been in the memory of David Alford, and has so far raised 52,000 pounds, which would allow someone to study at the AA for us to continue this program for something like the next seven years. We are currently in the process of planning a similar scholarship in memory of Alan Boyarsky. The Stephen Lawrence Scholarship has just been established on Friday, last Friday, uh, when we had the conference at the AA London Postcolonial School, with the assistance of a very generous donation to enable a student at, to, to study at the AA, one with the same passion for architecture as that of Stephen Lawrence, who tragically was unable to pursue his aspiration to become an architect. In addition, Sir Norman Foster has recently <coughs> agreed in the, last, in the past week to donate half of his Sterling Prize money towards our scholarship program in memory of James Sterling. Other recent contributions include donations from the Thomas Cubitt, Tarmac Trust, and all the Arab Partnership, and the Otto Kahn Foundation, who have agreed to work with us on the development of this student scholarship program. Tonight's event has been made possible through the general support of Word Search, and all the proceeds from the ticket sales will go directly towards our scholarship fund. Word Search's director, Peter Murray, is a graduate of the AA, past member of its council, and Peter has had a very close connection over the years with the school. He's been a great supporter of the school. And before I introduce Jonathan and Daniel, I would like to ask Peter to say a few words. Peter Murray.
So uh, my career has, has been uh, in communicating architecture in various ways. And uh, in uh, viewing the AA, I must say I'm often surprised that it's still, still here at all. Um, in 1967-68, well, as a student, uh, the discussions with mergers with the RCA and Imperial College was the start of a, a very sort of rocky period for the AA, when successive governments seemed intent on hastening its demise. But it is still here, and at the moment enjoying a, a, a period of relative stability, and it survives not just as a school, but as one of the world's most prestigious, progressive, influential centres of architectural thinking. So, WordSearch is very happy to support this evening's event and to help the scholarship fund to reach its target and help a broader range of students attend the school. Thank you very much.
recent, recent projects such as the DNA uh, Museum Competition and the Imperial War, War Museum uh, project in Manchester have, of course, provided in the new territories, new areas, which we're all looking forward to seeing how those become material, how those become material. With insight, clearly, challenges much of the work not to be practiced, which seems to be, in a sense, taken for granted. Would you please join me in welcoming Daniel Lipstein? Planning of Alexanderplatz in Berlin, but 
again, I, I didn't uh, search here for the more obvious 16 skyscrapers with stone walls, which were required by, by the politicians and administrators, but for what I would call a, a well, kind of homeopathic idea of the city, not uh, too invasive, not really concerned with the more obvious elements, but rather with the public memory of the city. And it, it's, it's a project very short, I cannot really explain it, but I, 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 I've applied this concept to a number of, uh, including a number of projects which are now being implemented. The Landsberg Ballet uh, planning project, which is in the former East Berlin, uh, along uh, the large eastern path of the former Lenin Ballet, is actually designed in that way. It's not designed by uh, simply the ecology of space, but it's designed by <coughs> dimensions of orientation, which go beyond the visible objects of the site. And uh, I use the same uh, principle in my uh, proposal for Algen Bioworkers, a composition about how to plan a model village of the 21st century. What, what would it be based on? And I certainly don't think it can, we can just pull out a piece of paper and start drawing, sketching, and giving a proposal for how an ideal village or ideal piece of city would be. Because that's not a realm of architects to just pull out a piece of paper and draw it. One would have to get involved in those less visible lineaments, which uh, which crisscross in a very interesting uh, way uh, through one's experience, and are also certainly made manifest in a certain way in the history of the artifacts, emotions, people's faces, the certain light that a certain time provides. Another project, a long time ago, uh, I don't know why I made it, I called it the Mies van der Memorial. It was not a commission, it was not uh, any memorial, it was just, just a panel, a large panel in which I conscripted all the erased writings of, you know, they went from Holderlin to Freud, from Flaubert to all the people I was interested in, in transcribing messages that have been erased in time. And uh, it's not really like the deciphering of the hieroglyphics. It's because it's not a systematic erasure. It's an erasure which itself is discontinuous. And, and I have to say that, that, that this is an idea which is not really just intellectual, theoretical. It is actually a very palpable and visceral idea when one comes to deal with programs of the erasure of signatures in the paintings of someone like Felix Nussbaum, famous painter at his time, uh, but a painter who's, in 1933, people began to erase the signatures of his paintings uh, because they didn't want them on, so they kept the paintings, many of them. Uh, so the, 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 the blankness and the strategy of designing a museum, which is a Felix Nussbaum house in Osnabrück, in a very conservative Catholic town, next to the cathedral, next to the walls of the city, was a way to understand, make visible, and give the experience back to the public of that erased palimpsest not as some act of fatality, but as an act in which we all, all the public, is involved because uh, what else is history. But, but very often uh, the communication of texts which themselves uh, are no longer clear. What, what is the experience? What did it represent? In Felix Nussbaum's case, uh, I, I proposed uh, and I built a building where the front uh, face of the building, the front volume, of course there are three different volumes which intersect with the, the grand front volume is itself a complete blank background. Against the front you see the poignancy of the sunflowers that he painted, uh, the, the, the Kunstwerke Museum of Osnabrück, which he loved, and simply the unpaintable uh, painting, which is verified in every one of his surviving works, which are also not just works of art, uh, art great works of art, very often, but also documents of a human will not to not to forget and not to not to disappear and to communicate across barbarism of this century something uh, of the spirit. And I know this is a word which is hardly used and slightly embarrassing to use it, but yes, architecture is uh, not just concrete and, 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 and all these things. It is something uh, uh, that is uh, affecting the soul. Uh, so. This photograph, which I once saw, and I never forgot uh, once I saw it, and I had it always, uh, I don't know why, I keep looking at it, and I keep thinking about what this destruction uh, in the century meant. It's, it's, of course, history is full of destruction, unfortunately, but what did it mean to, to, to 
from my experience to the experience of what I could understand. And, and this is a very incredible photograph uh, of, of, of a destroyed library, the books, uh, the burnt out windows, the, the caved walls. And yet, that is the city today as well. And, and the project for Sachsenhausen, which is uh, the project for the infrastructural lands connected with the former SS uh, lands in the, in the southern part of this huge uh, plan, which I was fortunate uh, to be involved in. I, mean, I, I was disqualified from the competition originally because I did not do what architects are supposed to do. We're supposed to, we were supposed to build 8,000 units of housing. And I just couldn't get myself to, to do it because once I delved the history of the area, I realized that even though these are resources of Germany, the only resources, the land of these poor places like Brandenburg or Brandenburg, there has to be something that ties it back into the future and also forward into the past. So, and I think that makes these two words up. Uh, in fact, I think, uh, the, the, though I was disqualified uh, and, and given some pride for reminding the jury that there is uh, some history to be taken care of, after six years, seven years of working on the project, uh, I'm very happy to say that the people of Oranienburg uh, decided that they don't want the, the 8,000 units of housing on this land. They want this plan, and the plan has been adopted. And again, it deals with the ultimate barren resident, but also you can see the incredible forms of architecture built by Beaux Arts architect, architects, by well trained Bauhaus architects who symbolize this particular evil with uh, powerful megastructural forms of symbols and how does one deal with this? It is in a problem. What does one do with this uh, with, with the world? Never mind just that, that huge triangular shape which is connected to the factories and so on. So again, the erasure, the transformation, the destruction, and at the same time the hope, and I call it the hope incision because without a hope, there would be no architecture anyway. If nobody would build anything. Uh, and that is the dimension of architecture which is constant through its kind of linearity. In, in a project created many years ago called the Line of Fire, I, I dealt, uh, or attempted to deal with the with, with, with notion of the discontinuity inevitably which arises between volumes of space, shelter, and building, and texts uh, of all kinds, uh, be they drawings or literary and musical texts, uh, things that uh, have been noted and recorded. And, and I created a, 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 a sort of for myself at least, and also for the public, because it was a public installation, a, a demonstration of the discontinuity and at the same time the necessary continuity which uh, we are all programmed to have. Uh, despite our talk of discontinuity, we are programmed for continuity. So uh, here uh, in, in the Jewish region in Berlin, I, I, I meditated on how would one show Jewish dimension of German Berlin history in a building which after all is a museum but at the same time has to address that which a museum cannot really view because it is not continuous with museology, it's not continuous in time, it is something which actually separates the museum from itself inevitably. Uh, call it the void, it's just a word, but it's an experience of, of a cut which goes through backwards and forwards through architecture and it is a radical cut because across that cut all sorts of possibilities and impossibilities transpire. Uh, and, well, I'm designing a house now uh, in, uh, for, a, for an art, uh, for an artist uh, uh, in Mallorca. And I, I thought a lot about this favorite, one of my favorite paintings, this Black Sparrow Malavich, uh, because uh, the client uh, is concerned with the, 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 the virtuality of the house in relationship to the artwork. And, and yet it's a, also a paradigmatic problem of housing in general. It's not just because the house, uh, I just showed the beginnings of, of, of the house, I don't know the size of it, but it will go into construction uh, very, very soon. And I hope to have some materials to, to, to show you uh, soon. And still another uh, fascination of mine is, is how uh, this for, foursome, uh, this, this, you know, this mythology of, of space and architecture, public space, is created. I created a machine for the Venice Biennale years ago, which I called the, the, the writing machine, which had on its 49 face, 49 cubes. It had 20 handles, which could be turned uh, independently by the audiences. So it's seven by seven by seven by seven. 49 
independently, arbitrarily rotated cubes to the public, but completely structured in terms of how they reveal fragments of the faces of ancient cities, names of saints, rituals, emblems, and creates, uh, by the participatory act, a configuration which is visible, buildable, and communicable as uh, city architecture imagination. Uh, an early proposal for a new project I'm working uh, on the Jewish Museum in San Francisco, which does not deal with the Holocaust, does not deal with history. In that sense, it deals with the successes of American Jewry in San Francisco, deals with the Jewish imagination, uh, cooking, humor, whatever. How does this, uh, this, this simultaneity of, of, of things uh, find its form in a building with a very uh, specific uh, program? In another project of mine, well, a long time ago, uh, I created this huge wheel that's bigger than this space uh, for a performance of Metamorphosis of Kafka in, in Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, I, I argued and I succeeded with the director, who was pretty open minded, to build a gigantic wheel on a single track which would cut through the audience and the stage and just move forward without any relationship to, uh, to Gregor Sansa. Uh, it's a gigantic wheel which would move electronically uh, on this rail. It's not pulled by anybody. It's not a chariot, it's not pushed by anybody, but it, 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 it wheels and, and, and moves across the space in a very, very decisive way. And I, I think that is also, of course, the, 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 the program of, of understanding the comfort in the 20th century, the, 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 the great privilege of being able to work on such a museum as, as the Imperial War Museum with its story, which is vivid and complex, of how to make these conflicts palpable to people who are not part of them, and yet their future will depend on their luminosity. Uh, so that, that's really part of the wheel, the shattered globalization and, and the fragments reassembled in ways which might go beyond uh, the reassembly process itself. And finally, just another one of my nine books that I once wrote, uh, this is a book on energy. Uh, and I, uh, you can see it's, it's, a, it's a kind of reincarnation of certain texts in my own mind, a reincarnation of, of, of plays, uh, of sonnets, of, of different forms of oblivious, uh, uh, of oblivion, in terms of uh, the constants which don't really change. And, and, and we know from physics that energy is one of the things that cannot be destroyed. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the proposal for the spiral. It is not just rhetorical, but really in every physical uh, way connected to that to that sight, to that thoughts, and whatever transpired in the minds of those who founded such a radical institution, whose mission is uh, thoroughly avant-garde and future-oriented. Yes, that's really all I really have to say because uh, really the, the chance to speak to Jonathan. Many thousands of years ago in prehistory, a man named Joshua destroyed the walls of Jericho by having his people blow trumpets around them. I think on the evidence before you, Daniel Liebeskin's a man that could have talked them down. And he had another occasion, in fact, which is where this conversation will start, of course. He's a great um, talker and a great conversationalist and, most of all, a great storyteller. And in a way, although his story begins some years ago in architecture, over 20 years, and of course before that, as you know, he was a musician, and he's come to architecture through quite a long way, he engaged our imagination, I think, collectively with the Jewish Museum in Berlin. It started off as an extension of the Berlin Museum, and has since become the tail that wags the dog, if that's not a poor metaphor for architecture. But what he's done, he entered Berlin at a very particular time in Berlin's story, the story of European politics and society, and the story of global politics and society. And I think if he hadn't entered Berlin at that one particular moment in its story, the fall of the wall, the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, that the reunification of Germany and the new face of Europe and thus the world, I don't think we would have had the building he's done. I think it could have been 
an impossibility. The building itself is a series of very, very, of exploded walls, as it were, not literally, of course. It's, the building's a sort of Star of David that's broken apart, and it resembles, because of that, a kind of great bolt of lightning, an expression a number of us have used, because it's a good way of describing it. It seems like a bolt of lightning moving through Berlin. It broke the wall, as it were, and it broke our certainties about what a monument might be, and it told a brand new story about what European architecture might be and what European society might be. Daniel Liebeskind, as I said, perhaps the great, one of the greatest storytellers in contemporary architecture, and that's how he comes in. He took that project and he won that project in a big international competition because most of all he understood that what people were looking for, I think, not just the judges and the jury, but Berlin, Europe, the world, was a chance to tell a story afresh about who we are and where we live and where we're going, a story about a new level of freedom. Without that storytelling ability, he might have created something which you're much more familiar with, which would be a box of sorts. And all museums, in one way, are big boxes, big containers, and they can be very exciting or extremely dull. Daniel's chosen to make a very exciting exploded box, and I think that's where I really want to engage him first, because, excuse me, because I'll play devil's advocate to an extent, because I'm a great admirer of his work, but I would say, as I'm sure many of you would say, or you might want to ask this, and let me hog the questions for a while before we throw it out to you, because that's my privilege tonight. It's that story, and Daniel, that story you told in Berlin with that building, it's really your story, isn't it? And here's this moment where an architect comes from a very particular background, which we will discuss, mm -hmm. and I will provoke you into talking about, to make that one key building that's not only made your career, as it were, as an architect who builds, but to make museums afresh and cities afresh. So is that building really you? It's Daniel Liebeskin. Well, if I wasn't there, the building wouldn't get built. But it isn't me. It, 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 it is not uh, really my story. It's a story of every Jewish Berliner and every Jew who, who passed through that, through that experience and lived to tell the story. Because, uh, I, I mean, I, and I think it, it's interesting that you say it, because it, it really di it's not really one story which, is, which, which the building actually delves into. There are a number of different possibilities and a, and a number, actually many different stories which, which, which are told in the building. But one of the key things about the building is that you built a museum that almost doesn't need any objects in it. The museum tells the story about the Jewish disappearance from Berlin. It tells the story of the void. It tells the story about a culture that was destroyed and slowly asserting itself again. But you almost don't need anything in it. In other words, you've done everything. You've designed the museum as a monument, and you've designed, everything. You've designed the curators out of a job. No, I, no I, I never imagined a museum as being an empty one. I, I always, uh, you know, in, in, in the competition we got, we received, you know, all German competitions have almost telephone book size uh, listings of every object and every and and sort of vitrines. Everything was this, it, it was in the program where the things were to go. Uh, and of course, the program has changed. As, you know that the building has changed, and it is still changing because the program it, it already has had what six different names. Uh, the, the building has had six different names, starting with the Jew, you know, Berlin Museum of the Jewish Abteilung, the Jewish Department. Then it was the Jewish Department and the Berlin Museum. Then then it was the Jewish Museum in the Stadt Museum, then it was a Stadt Museum and the Jewish Museum, now it's the Jewish Museum Berlin, and I'm sure it's not the last name change. It will still go on. So what I try to do is to preserve within the changing uh, horizons, because the building is not an inert thing, it's, it's a dynamic process, the possibility of showing, the showing things. But of course, I, I didn't uh, see the showing of Berlin history as a repository for uh, objects. It's, uh, it would not be adequate, I think, to show Berlin's history in the you know, leftover menorahs and the Torah scrolls. Of course, they're very important, and I had them clearly in mind and designed spaces for them. But I think what is very important is the experience of being in the building, which is part of the process which has generated the remaining objects. <laughs> well, the curious thing, the building did, was completed this spring. Yes. And a number of us, a lot of people, had the privilege to go and see it. And people do go now and tours around the building. Very strange. A year before it has any objects, it is completed. And why now? Why now put anything in? I think it, it just simply is. It tells its story. 
You well, told it. Well, many people uh, ask that question. I, I'm convinced that it will become much better with objects. I, I don't believe that it should be filled up with you know, the 5,000 <laughs> objects that were in the competition brief. But I think it, 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 there should be very much, and I can envision, in, and, and that's how the spaces were designed. They're, they have white walls, there are spaces functionally designed for those events to take place. But certainly, it's a changing uh, time, and people will develop new ideas on the basis of the challenge that the building uh, proposes. And I have to be very honest that I think it would be wrong to design a Jewish museum, which you can just fill with, you can just fill with some uh, things, and say, that's the story of Jews in Germany, because that wouldn't be their story. <laughs> their story is not like that. You can't just put a few things in a, in a box and say, that's the story, that's the Jewish Berlin, that's the Jewish Germany. That story is much more um, deep. And I think the building provides spaces, and I, I'm glad to say that the curators who are now there see, uh, even though they see it as a challenge, see it as a very positive one. The, the negative publicity, uh, originally people say, well, what can you do with it? And I think it has disappeared. People say, yes, we will have here uh, a place for encounter and, and, and stories. One of the things that struck me about it very forcibly when I first saw the model of the Jewish Museum, this great zigzag form, this exploded Star of David, was this, that in Germany, more than anywhere else in the world, Jews were assimilated. They were Jews, they were Germans, one and the same thing. And that's why, well, their experience was so... Mm -hmm. Well, apart from being deeply savage, was deeply shocking in the sense that they were Germans, what mm -hmm. was happening to their country. And yet, your building doesn't follow a German mood, a Berlin mood, does it? It actually breaks Berlin apart. Berlin, over the last 10 years, has become this city, this rigid Prussian city of grids again, with horrible, shiny buildings in it, which are all disastrous, every single one, sorry. But, and then you come along and you actually break it up. So you're not being very German and Jewish there, are you? Well, I... Maybe I am. Uh, I, I don't think it's uh, something which is out of order. I think the building uh, is very contextual, and, and I think it fits very well into the context with its program and with its appearance. So I don't really see that it's... Uh, on the other hand, I see what is actually going on in Berlin, something rather foreign. <laughs> you know, the, the, the big developments and the kind of architecture which is, which is actually uh, imposed on Berlin is not really Berlinish. In, in any sense of the word. So uh, it, it depends, of course, where one takes one's stand. But I was always very moved uh, when I discovered that all Berlin Jews were deported to Lodz, the city I was born in, mm -hmm. because it was considered on the way to Auschwitz or other places, uh, if, if they survived that long, because Lodz and the Pol Poland seemed to be the, the anti-world anti to Berlin Jewry and, and to Berliners in general. So. There is a, 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 a logic, actually, of where the building is coming from. Let's, <laughs> let's investigate that logic, though, because one thing that the building has been accused of by people that haven't visited it is being somehow illogical. I mean, there is, over the last, over the last 60 years, on the whole, most architecture has been quite rational with a capital mm -hmm. R, mm -hmm. straightforward space, blocks, cubes, and so on. And you've chosen not to do that. So in fact, the, the experience of walking through the building to begin with, is actually very confusing. One doesn't know which way does one turn in this building. It's extraordinary space. You don't know where to go. You move around, mm -hmm. I guess, freely. But is there an underlying logic? Y yes, there is. But it's not the logic of the cubes, and it's not the marching orders that museums might be getting from some fictitious uh, history. But it is another kind of logic. It is a logic of following a certain trajectory of light, of space, of orientation, and also, inevitably, of finding yourself in a problematic state. And something else, too, isn't there? Because one of the things about the, the building, it does somehow pick up traces of Berlin's Jewish history, doesn't it, and, and translates into physical form. Very, uh, very literally, actually. How does it do it? Well, for example, the window configurations are, are, are just physical projections. You know, I took the, the map of Berlin and I plotted the names, first of all, of people who lived around Lindenstrasse and, and around Frederikstadt. And I just plotted the names, Germans and Jews, connections. And I uh, finally projected this, these connections, cutting through the, 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 the faces of the building, in, into, through the building. So actually what you see on the building is a topographical record of s lines, very abstract lines, because those lines don't no longer exist in the city grid. There are no more streets there. There are no more 
people living in, in those houses, but, but the building is uh, exactly a physical realization of what that connection looks like in that space which the building blocks. Does it matter, Danny, if people understand it or not? Well, I think people, first of all, have to enjoy and, and have an experience which makes them interested in, in understanding. It, it, it is analogous to a work of, you know, to, to anybody who's listening to music, and if people like Bach, they might even get interested to, to delve into, you know, if they know something about the notes, uh, what does it look like and where does it come from. And so, but I don't think it's necessary. I think you can enjoy good music without having a lot of uh, uh, musical education. You can just enjoy the sound. And I think the building, uh, like I think many uh, other buildings, uh, can be read on different uh, levels and enjoyed also. The building actually is quite musical, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it does have its own harmony. This may sound quite strange, but as you walk through the building, every building does have a harmony. And we're all brought up to think of these things like golden sections, and we can think of Bach connecting to Palladio, and that's all quite easy for us in uh, Western culture to do. But in, in that building, the Jewish Museum, there's something else going on, isn't there? There's a, ki there's a kind of assonant music. There's a music that's a side, isn't there? A modern music. Well, well it is. It, it is. it is the... The, the culmination of kind of music in Berlin, and, and I took it uh, physically from the discontinuous Moses and Aaron opera of Schoenberg, who, by the way, worked right next to Lindenstrasse as a professor of music before he was ejected from the position. And I actually took it because I always thought that this discontinuity of modern music, and of course, after he emigrated from Berlin to California, his music changed. He, he didn't continue in the same way, but I, I thought it should continue in the space of that rhythm which is left, uh, uh, left hanging in the void of the city. And I literally took uh, that, uh, that expanded silence which comes at the end of, uh, of the question that Moses uh, doesn't sing but uh, simply poses, uh, that the word is missing. And it's missing not only as a musical word but as a word that can be recorded. So I, I, I basically attempted to complete in a, in a different dimension, which cannot be completed, I don't believe it can be completed musically, but it can be completed in the space of the void, because it's not a panoramic space, not a space which you can control, it's a space you can walk through. The void, I guess you all know, is this one great controlling element that runs throughout the building and gives it a logic. It's a separate concrete structure that runs right through this exploded Star of David, which is actually built of concrete steel and covered in zinc but this void runs right through, doesn't it? It runs right through, and it's in the center, but it's not uh, ever visible from the center. It's always, you, uh, you encounter it through different, through the underground, you, you encounter it in different ways. It's not a line, which is a graphic line, it's a spatial volume, actually, which is full cut through the entire 150 or 200 meter uh, block of Berlin. So here's a building that really does, I mean, you're saying it now, it, you're telling, it tells many, many stories, and you've been I've been guessing them out of you one by one. Out they come, these stories. <laughs> what would you do, Danny, faced in a very different position where it might not be a story for you to tell? You've made, you've got a great story there to tell. It's your story. It's experience of your family, your upbringing, your whole culture. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of here, you were sort of here mm -hmm. to make that building, design mm -hmm. that building. And you've got, a, in Britain, you've got buildings that will tell a story. You've got the Imperial War Museum which will tell a story, an obvious one to all of us, or one we all know, and you'll reinterpret it differently. But what would you do without a story? Can you design a building without a story? Face what a, a dull, boring uh, commercial office block. A big filing cabinet in the sky where we all have to slave away in dreary air-conditioned tedium. What would you do with that? Well, th there is a, a piece of wisdom, I don't remember where it comes from, but it says that God created the world so that stories could be told. Uh, I don't think there is uh, something that you are now referring that has no story, that is a dull... You, I, I don't think there is such a space in human experience which is just n not there. Because everything, once it has been perceived, once it has become thematized, is already part of a struggle. So, 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 I, don't, so I don't think... Well, maybe it is difficult to design a good office building. You're right. Uh, it, it's a different level of problem. But I don't think uh, I would shirk, uh, you know, if I was given the opportunity to design an office building, which I actually tried to, you know, I, I did. But unfortunately, when the land became available and the project did not go ahead. But, uh, but I would like to design a, a, an interesting uh, office building. How would you do it? What, where was the, where's the stories? 
Uh, the stories, well, uh, I can give an example from my own work. I, I took the stories. Uh, this was a, a, a large uh, complex in Wiesbaden, uh, which uh, was about to be built uh, for about 3,000 uh, people to work there. Uh, but then the American army left after the uh, unification and, uh, you know, buildings became involved, so it did not go ahead, nothing was built on its site. Maybe it will be. But I, I designed it along different lines. What do people do at work? What do they need? You know, people can't just work all the time. They have to look at something. They have to look at the landscape. They have to think of other things uh, to be creative. So I designed it around uh, what I call the muses. Uh, well, you can say an office building as a museum, no, but museum in a sense, uh, in the etymological sense, that a museum is the house of, 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 of inspiration, right? I mean, I think, the, I think the first museum technically was a university, if I'm not correct. I mean, there might be historians here uh, in Alexandria. I think the first building, which was actually called a museum, was not what we understand. It was a house of the muses, which is presided over by memory. So it was about memory. It was about, uh, you know, trees growing on you know, a certain landscape, which was, uh, yeah. I, I can't <laughs> describe it without pictures, because, uh, but, but I think it is possible to, to not to just create and not to make up a story, but to listen to a story which is already there. Let's think about something else Nick, close by. Most of us spend the day either working these days in offices of some sort, which we talked about here, or we go back home or we wake up in home. Um, Britain, at the moment, there's this discussion which none of us actually understands at all. If anyone in this room <laughs> does, um, I would give them the jacket off my back. It's this question about <coughs> building homes in Britain that we've got somehow to build 3.3. Um, 4.4, any advance, 5.5, 6.6, you know, million new homes. They're either going to be Milton Keynes multiplied by a thousand times, or they're going to be wonderful brownfield sites or greenfield sites. But nobody actually has the answer, of course. If they did, um, architects wouldn't be in business. Um, but because they're trying to find the solution. But any home, imagine homes in Britain, you are actually a listed contender in a competition to possibly master plan this second millennium village at Allerton in the Midlands. And you, housing, mass housing, what on earth did you do? I can't no, see no, I, I didn't start by saying, okay, let's, here's a plan, let's draw out the streets and, and, and divide it into the houses. I, I asked myself the question, what would constitute a, a community uh, over a long period of time? I, I, it's not a question of just building a nice model, and nice. how would it work so that people who live there and who have lived there already before, and new people would find a, a identity with the place. So it's also a, 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 a concept which has to do with who owns what, who, 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 who does it belong to? And my proposal, perhaps it doesn't have much chance, proposes that the people who live there should own the assets of the entire place and become part of the place. It should not be just mass housing, as you say, or just abstract units calculated for rental or for sale, but it should be a, first of all, a community. So that doesn't start with uh, just an idea of graphic uh, master planning, uh, but, but a concept of how can one link, first of all, the people who are already there, who have lived there for generations, new inhabitants will come there, and what would be the reasons that people would find an identity and a pleasure and a beauty in this incredible landscape, which, which it has, an incredible history of mining and of, uh, of, of history. And nevertheless, at some point, you would, as a, f as a very strong form giver, you would give shape, wouldn't you, to housing. Every project you've done is a very, very powerful, very memorable form. At some point, where do you, as the architect, come in and, I will give the form now. You mean specifically in housing? No, in, any, in anywhere, but housing you'd have to do it. But there's a point where you come in, isn't there, and you give such strong forms to buildings, and you're quite deterministic in that way. So you're listening to stories, and then there's a point there. What is that point where you, you're listening, and then pow, well, out comes these incredible forms? Well, you ask a difficult question, because I, I mean, if, 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 it, if, if, I could, if I could just say, well, they just come from nowhere, they just, they just appear, it would be wrong. They, they do come from a one has to have a vision of what, what, is th 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 what does it look like and what does it feel like to be there. Uh, I, I think architecture in that sense is an incredible thing because it cannot be simulated on computers. I have a lot of computers in our office. You, you know very well that no matter what you do with a simulated space, you cannot really simulate human 
imagination, you, a response, it, it, no matter how quant you can quantify it. So I think form making uh, it, it by itself is not really something I'm interested in, in making the form by itself. It's what is the continuity of the form into non-form? It comes from not non-form. Well, let's take a, let's take a um, literally a concrete example, which would be the new building for the Victoria and Albert Museum. Now, as soon as that goes ahead, the spiral is a building with an immensely powerful form again. And yet, as yet, we don't quite know how it might work. And yet, there you are giving a form. Are you not there, actually, being deterministic? Well, you have to be there as an architect, I, 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 unless you want to do it by committee or by uh, some sort of vote. And we have experiences of what those things look like. They don't look too good. Because, you know, you don't have novels by committee. You don't have music by committee. There have been attempts, uh, but they have never really worked uh, empirically. So I, I think one has to uh, take responsibility for what one is doing, not just on the for, uh, architecture or formal, but also on the ethical level of how the thing has come to be what it is. And uh, uh, that's, that's what one would say is the real thing versus the fraudulent uh, imposition. So how do you, and I hear, I hear so many things in my job, uh, vicious gossip, horrible things, nasty stuff, all comes my way as well as wonderful <laughs> things. And I hear people say, I'll say the sort of things people say about the v &A spiral, as they might say about another of your buildings. They might say, oh, it's um, just crazy shapes. <laughs> crazy shapes. No? Just trying to shock. Mm -hmm. Nothing else, an architecture of shock. I mean, is that, what would you say, you meet them face to face, I'm going to be that person now and say to you, your buildings, Macy Boy, are just crazy shapes. Would you, uh, no, I, I, would, I would have to, you know, if you had the patience, I would have to take you I through can't. All the things that, that, that are there and to, 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 sh to try to demonstrate uh, in a rational way that, that they are not crazy shapes and that they are not willful and arbitrary and no matter how unexpected they might actually appear to be, they, they, they follow a logic which is thoroughly uh, compelling if, if one you know, is open to it. I mean, sometimes people are just not open to it and it is not, yeah, then it's a closed book. Uh, but, but I think... Uh, uh, I've been very encouraged that very often and, and uh, at the DNA we had people who turned bright red and who were so angry and who were violent uh, and if I if they just gave me five seconds uh, to say well just don't be you know don't be you know be open-minded and I, I was very impressed that people do have uh, a, a, in England tremendous uh, kind of tolerance to listen and after a while they might say well I don't really still like it but my daughter likes it so uh, at least that much, you know, could, uh, could come out of it. But uh, uh, look, it's also a matter of luck, uh, you, you know, to, because uh, sometimes great projects, uh, interesting projects that I admire from, you know, Baroque times or Renaissance times were never realized. I mean, you look at the architects who are really incredible. What did they, how, you know, uh, the oeuvre of Michelangelo we were just speaking about him this afternoon. How, how little was realized, and yet he was a man with tremendous practical experience though he had big wings. <laughs> but does, does it shock you in a funny way now to be, to be building? Because there you were for many years as a musician or working in academia, of course creating these fabrications we've talked about and heard about, but you were quite detached from the world of actual building. I mean, is it something you'd have been happy in one way not to have done? Was it just one occasion in a way that brought you into it and now it's tumbling around and you can't stop? I don't think so, at least the way I see it. I, I don't see it as just a freaky accident because I don't see that what I was doing then when I was not attending uh, meetings with the Senate, not discussing money with banks, not being on the telephone with uh, whatever. I see that that work was, I never s thought about it as something which was detached, although it might have looked uh, in relationship to practice as something rather detached, but it, it's also about this, what one understands one is trying to do. Of course, I, I, I was lucky to be able to have realized the Jewish Museum as my first building uh, without, by the way, I never really worked in an ar architect's office in my entire life. I never, w you know, I w entered a few offices and I just didn't like the, the, the yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I didn't like the way th th it looked. And I said, but I want to be an architect, but this is not exactly uh, what, what I thought it was. So uh, in some way, one has to, I think, be lucky to pursue uh, at least what one believes. And uh, even if it doesn't always work, and, and, and there is a risk to doing something, uh, if, if it's worth doing, it's always uh, something that 
is not perhaps the easiest thing that, that could be done. Uh, you have a lot of sleepless nights. You think to yourself, you know, is it worth going to that extra meeting? And is it, you know, is it worth making it? But I think it is, if one loves architecture, if one loves space, if one loves the idea that buildings are just part of something greater than, than themselves. But is there, will you, now that you're actually building, and you've already built a couple of gems, and you've got some very special buildings coming up on the drawing boards, mm -hmm. if not the computers, what will happen if, which I suspect is a danger, you become more and more of a celebrity. You become more and more, in a way, a, an architect in demand. Big corporate sponsors, big business start saying, oh, we'd like one of those buildings because they're very characterful. Mm -hmm. They give us an image. Everyone's looking for a gimmick these days, a trade, a logo. We live in a world of logos and brands, that nightmare mm -hmm. world, that word. I mean, could you, is there a danger of you being a brand? Many it's happened to many architects that we've met over the last 20 years. They become sort of big brands and they kind of, in a way, because of that, lose the storytelling ability of their sort, they lose the spirit and the soul, and they end up feeding a big architectural machine that just devours them, then they become a brand like Diesel Jeans mm -hmm. or something. Could it happen to you? Would you let it happen? I, I don't, no. <laughs> <laughs> In a word. No, I wouldn't, because, uh, because I'm aware that, uh, that what one does has to be enjoyable, first of all. I mean, I wouldn't enjoy having... Uh, like Philip Johnson showed me what 50 skyscrapers at one point in his office said, look, I, we're doing all of these buildings at once. I, I don't think this is my interest uh, in architecture. I, 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 I like uh, the, the possibility of working on a few things and not, uh, not a lot. I, I don't see really uh, falling into that, that system because I don't practice the architecture as a system. Uh, I, I don't, of course it is a system. Everything is a system because if there was no system, we couldn't really get up in the morning. But it's to try to make it somehow close to interest of other people and people work on it. And of course, architecture is not produced by one individual. It's produced by teams, by many people. Uh, it, it's, it's not just a person sitting with the one sketch and, 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 and giving it over to some anonymous machine that it gets sort of churned out and replicated all around the world. At least that's not my uh, idea of how to do it. So I'm afraid that uh, I won't be a good... Uh, example of that kind. We can hold you to this in uh, 10 years' time. Uh, absolutely. Hold me. I'll come back here. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the intriguing things uh, about walking, coming back to the Jewish Museum of Berlin, and then I want to throw this thing open to the audience, is this, that as one walks around it, one's aware of being in a building that has tremendous passion, both in the way it's conceived the way people experience it. And strangely, one of the strangest things I saw when I went there, which your wife Nina pointed out to me, was actually in the construction of the building. There was one point where Bosnian workers had written a graffiti across the walls of the building being, being built, mm -hmm. which is now being kept as an exhibit in the building. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful phrase. It said, if I'll get it wrong, but try, I think I'll no, try it. It said, when the Jews leave a city, it's, the, sort of it's, it's not a good omen, yeah, it's, it's, not, not, a good it's not, a good, not, not a good omen, it's an old Bosnian Which of course problem. happened to them yeah. too, of course, we know in, in their own experience in recent years in Bosnia. Um, it's, there's something there, isn't there, how that spirit of a building that involves workers too, even in buildings made of industrial materials, you've managed to get that level of involvement. Did you expect that? I don't think it's something you can plan for. If something is real, if, if it's really involving something which is true, I, I believe that at least, then other people would find it so because, uh, and I have to tell you a very funny story, when I designed the building and after I had uh, even received approvals from, from the administration in, in Berlin and from the very severe DIN norms of, of Germany and even I received the possibility to, to, to build those windows and those walls, one thing I didn't expect which is that no matter what permissions you get and, 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 and even it's on cost and everything is uh, really refined, you have to have people who are willing to build it that way. Because that's not something you can, you can predict. People can say, and many people said, keep drawing, keep doing, but nobody's ever going to build this thing because people just don't work that way. And I, I was very naive because I didn't know too much about it, but I think that actually helped me. Because I believed that in every fold of that uh, zinc and in every uh, way it was made, it was part of a story. It wasn't just a technical operation and I, I actually I don't know how but the people who made this building 
were definite because they stayed a long time. It, it's more complicated to fold this zinc than just do it twice. You have to go at least four, four more times inside and you have to get into corners and you have to do certain things which are physically uh, not just a normal nine to five job. But I was very pleased that without ever speaking to the workers about the idea of the building and I never explained to them what the building was and never lectured them, they got the idea. They knew the building very well and I never forget uh, Andre, a Polish worker who was uh, working on the concrete in, in the Holocaust Tower, he was there at 9 o'clock in the evening. He said, what are you doing here? Because I speak Polish. And he said, I'm just cleaning it. I'm it, try it should be really uh, completely straight. It shouldn't be bumpy. And I couldn't believe, why was he doing it? What, what, what motivated him? But I think it's because it was different from, from other buildings. That's part of it. And because it's not just... Uh, the control of the architects. And, and, and by the way, it goes further to the people who use the building. They are not, uh, it's not the, at the end when it's built. It's, I think it says to start li living when people start moving into the offices and, and moving into the exhibit spaces and it then has to really come alive. And uh, I think that's the function of, of a building. If it's just an object made for consumption or if it's just an object which is pretty, uh, uh, then it will become very dull, I think, in, in a short time. Well, you certainly haven't built buildings for consumption, that can never be said. Um, I've hogged the limelight because that's been my role and that's been a pleasure. I um, hope I haven't been too no, no. cruel. No, no, you are um, tough. Interrogating, <laughs> am I? Um, but the, uh, please, there must be questions you want to ask. I've asked mine out loud because there's so many that you want to ask of Daniel Liebeskin. So it's a big, big room and not a sort of very intimate one. So it's very impossible to bring you all together in that cosy way. But let's try. There's some people with microphones wandering around, and they have to scurry like ball boys in a tennis court. Um, let's start there. I think. Over here. Um, Christian, you said that the architects were very Very uh, complex questions, but uh, it's, the, it's, it's our responsibility to remember. <laughs> because if we forgot, uh, there would be nothing left. I, I don't think, uh, I, I think memory is not just a sentimental or nostalgic dimension. I think it's, it's what, what we are when we are, so to speak, in, in the, in, 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 why we have been created. <laughs> I mean, without really, any theology here or any, you know, what, what are we here for but to remember uh, what it is about, what it might be about, what it also was. So that experience of memory and of, <laughs> of, of, uh, of the public I think has to do with kind of the, the physicality also of a place because the places are really irreplaceable in, in, my, in my view. And I've lived in different places and I don't really have a home that you could call is mine. Uh, where I really say that those are my roots, that's where I live, that's my piece of land, that's where I belong, that's where I come from. I don't have such an experience. Therefore, I see actually that every place is really not replaceable by any other place. It's not part of any system which could make it exchangeable. And I think that character of it is what makes it memorable. And uh, in architecture, for example, the Jewish Museum is in a very particular space. It stands, it's in the void of Berlin. The void is in Berlin. And it's traversing, you know, it, it's made visible. I mean, the, the void has a shape uh, and, and the building has a shape. And I think to give that shape makes it possible also to remember because without something very concrete, uh, you couldn't hold in the memory. First of all, you would have to experience it uh, uh, physically, I, I think, not intellectually with your, uh, and, and I've always was very impressed when I read uh, St. Augustine in the City of God, I, I believe it is. Some are, he says that everybody is always leaving Babylon, but some are leaving with their legs and some are, or with their ankles and some are leaving with their hearts and souls. I, that's stuck in my mind. I don't know why. But he, because everybody, he says, is always leaving Babylon, but some are just trudging, you know, just, but anyway, they're leaving. So that's really the part of the architectural 
device or, or understanding that buildings and cities and, and spaces which are public certainly have. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Somebody in the back there. some of your works, and so my question might be unfair, um, uh, but uh, if uh, you were not to call yourself uh, an architect uh, for a second, and uh, up there yourself uh, an iconoclast, um, th there seems to be in the very few works that are not yours, that you seem to take um, symbols or uh, icons, icons, uh, and sometimes you translate them uh, in your own language uh, through uh, perhaps fragmentation, uh, for example, the fault of the, the spiral, uh, the Star of David. Uh, what is the meaning of uh, taking um, uh, symbols or icons and uh, hopefully not merely fragmenting them? Uh, and uh, I'm sure it's not that simple. I, I think it's a good question. I don't start with the symbols. That's the whole point. I didn't start with a spiral. And Cecil is here, Cecil Bauman, who is my collaborator. We collaborate together. We, we didn't, it wasn't sort of the idea, let's take a spiral and let's make a spiral building. Not at all. It was a completely different project. And the spiral emerged and it was, then it could be named as a spiral, but it took a long time to perceive uh, that it indeed was the spiral and to make the connection that that spiral uh, of, of the DNA itself is part of the same movement of space and of ideas and of the emblems that are incarnated in the works of you know, William Morris and, and, and Henry Cole, particularly, who actually named the spiral as a spiral. But I, I don't think it's about, uh, it's about um, symbols and anything of that sort uh, as, as, as a ground for working. I think it's to work with the pragmatic problems, and not in an iconoclastic way, but in a very practical way, and to discover that no pro no, there is no problem uh, which is... Uh, which is casual, that, not any, not, that everything which is touched by architecture is radical because it has to do with, with the world. It's, it's, uh, architecture is very, it's an incredible profession. Everything is in the ground. There's a violence in construction. There is a lot of effort and money and, and demand. So this is not a profession uh, for the weak hearted because everything you touched is already a very ra radical thing. Uh, even just digging a little bit of the ground. Uh, questions, uh, you know, who to who does it belong? I'm, I'm working now in San Francisco and I asked the question, you know, they got, you know, who does Yerba Buona belong to? Who, did they buy it from the Indians? Who, 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 where, where did it come from? Uh, who owns the land? This is part of the project also, because I think any piece of architecture has to ethically go back to its own legitimacy is a legitimate piece of work, unlike other things which are not in the public space. I don't know whether I answered your question. It's a pretty tough one, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah. Who else? There's 500 of you. Specifically, something. 
Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, technically the, uh, and truly the competition was anonymous. My name is Liebeskind, uh, which is also a German name. It is a German name, actually. Uh, nobody was selecting a Jewish architect in this competition. Of course, consequently, co as a consequence of the competition, you know very well that most buildings don't get realized from competitions. Competitions are just... Uh, the graveyards of ideas. Very few buildings have ever been realized in Berlin. And we know all the famous Mies projects and Polsik projects, Barron's projects, uh, you know, fantastic projects, which that, that, that's, it's not to be realized. But sure, the, one has to uh, be committed, but one has to also be open-minded to the change. And I have to say, I had not moved to Germany with a plan. I moved there on the spur, really on the spur of the moment, realizing that uh, that it, it is a, a moment. And I, I'm glad I did move to Germany because I, I, I abandoned many of my prejudices about Germany. And I had them too because I came from a certain background. And I'm, and, and I'm glad I moved there. And I hope that you come to Germany because uh, it's interesting. It's but interesting. It was important to you, wasn't it? Because I remember you said when we were in Berlin last year, you said, I asked you in the car, would you ever have gone to Berlin? if you hadn't won that competition, and you said no, without hesitation. And, I and then you said your family, it had created really ruptions in your family that you had gone to Berlin, when in fact you could have been going across to the, you had this Getty, yes. wonderful Getty Center scholarship yes. where yes. you could have gone, gone to the sun and <laughs> had a nice time there. Instead you chose to go to this extraordinary maelstrom of a city. But you did say that you have never have gone there, didn't you? So it's no, because it, it is, it is, uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, a ch it's an encounter of, of a possibility. And, you, and, and by the way, when I decided to move to a hotel, and you know, Nina and my, my, my wife and collaborator, by the way, she was the one who was uh, much ahead of me as we were crossing the street in the middle of, after picking up the prize, she turned to me and said, you realize what this means? And as the cars were whizzing by, I realized what she had asked. It meant that we have to check into a hotel somewhere. We knew nobody in Berlin. We knew, you know, we had two kids, uh, you know, uh, and a baby. Uh, Rachel and we really it was not a very planned but I think that's part of it I think that's part of the reality because people said there is really no reason to move to Berlin uh, go away uh, you don't need to be here look all these other architects have b built in Berlin without ever having been there but I think you have to be interested in it <laughs> you have to be interested in it and uh, sure I, I was you know my, my family had problems uh, you know why did I go to Germany and it's a terrible thing for, their, you know, for, for somebody from their family to, to be there. And, and we were not visited by, still are not, by, by almost anybody, many people. <laughs> uh, they, they meet us in Holland or in Belgium or you know, on the borders. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think there is a lesson to it because things do change. People change, history changes. And I think that's the, 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 the hope that there is, that things don't stay the same. And, uh, and one is not just a, a, an observer of them. It, it's by committing oneself for better or for worse. I mean, maybe it was very naive in a certain way because I, little did I know that it would take 10 years that I would have to you know, do, do things that I never thought w were part of this. But I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad and uh, uh, the, the rest of your question, uh, I, I don't know really how to answer because I can only speak from my limited perspective. Well, you can. I mean, it's a hugely important question. Though. That's most important this evening in some ways because, you know, that project we started off talking about in Berlin and talking about now, it comes back to that. You know, this bit, whole question, could a non-Jewish architect have done it? But we do know, don't we, that, that at fact some of the greatest buildings for other religions, I mean for mine, like for a Catholic, uh, some of the greatest buildings have been um, by professed atheists. Um, Cabusier, <laughs> well, I'm not sure what Cabusier was. In fact, he was, he well, was, he was he an Albigensian. He was, yeah, an Albigensian, a Cathar, yeah. so he was slightly different. But in a sense, though, but his great enemies, as we know, were the Dominicans, who tried, and the Dominicans, of course, were like the um, Germans trying to destroy 
familiar with the Jews, the Dominicans tried to destroy the Albigensians, the Cathars, and actually did burn them and had a yeah. program to destroy them. Um, you know the story very well in the 13th century. But the, it's interesting that, the, that Cabusier builds his greatest building of all, that's yeah. for his enemy. And it's absolutely extraordinary. And it's a building of perhaps the greatest, most profound spiritual, the 20th century, the most profound spiritual experience you can have is go to that Tourette. But, but it's interesting. Well, build, that's, a, that's, a very moving, that's a very moving description because I, when I designed the underground with the three streets uh, in the Jewish Museum, one leads to a garden, one leads to a dead end, the Holocaust, and one leads to the stair of continuity. I thought, really, it's not about the Jews. It's the, all the others and, and the people who are in Berlin when I moved there, you know, the Turks and the Vietnamese and uh, Poles and, and Yugoslavians. So I never thought this is limited somehow. It's an ethnographic, ex it's not. Because if there is one thing about that particular program is that it doesn't fit into any ethnographic uh, profile since uh, you cannot really re uh, cartoon out what is specifically, what would we understand about what was specifically Jewish about any of those not just the famous uh, Einsteins and, and Schoenbergs and Liebermans, but about the anonymous workers who are part of that successful and quite incredible high peak of, of civilization at some point. So I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a question of, of, the, yeah, of the human spirit. It's not uh, about some narrow... Uh, um, It's people, and and I was very moved when when a group of uh, of Kurds came to me, uh, who had visited uh, the museum, and said, you know, we feel, you know, we don't know much about this museum, but it it has the, the it kind of reminds us, of of of, of us. <laughs> well, it's now the cheap, tickets are cheap now. Um, we're going to stop because it's always best to stop, um, on a sort of high. And we've moved right through from practicalities to spiritual storytelling. It's funny, when, before we came up here, um, we didn't realize it was going to be such a big room and such a big audience. We did think we were going to do a, a double act. We were either going to tell bad Irish jokes and bad Jewish jokes, yeah. we? <laughs> or we were, going to play, we were going to play some music together and sing some terrible songs. Um, we realized we've got to, we've got, it might have been a bad idea tonight. We've come around to something slightly more um, found than that. So, Gosh, thank you for being thank here. You. Danny, thank, thank you for listening. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.